Welcome to this If Oxford event tonight, making new traditions the art of whisky distilling in Oxford. It should be a fun session which involves a bit of interactive uh, whisky tasting uh, and exploring some of the complex flavours and some of the complex and also simple processes of making whisky in Oxford. There's a great team tonight uh, to talk you through the process and it's a pleasure to be doing this for our second year with the Oxford Artisan Distillery and I'm going to introduce Charlie, who has the auspicious title of Head of Whiskey, who will introduce his colleagues and walk you through the session. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. I'd say, Dane, science and senses, if you just came up with that, I'm, I've, that was great. I'm fond of that. I've taken a note. That's all right. But yes, um, I'll, I'll introduce you to my colleagues. I'm, I'm Charlie, as Dane said, and Head of Whiskey, so I'm very much uh, interested in whiskey. Uh, but these, these two guys are crucial to it also. Uh, we've got John Letts here, here's John, and John's our head of farming. Um, but he's uh, a lot more than that, and uh, you'll find that out. He'll tell you about farming in a way that will uh, hopefully inspire you as much as it inspires me. And then we've got um, Chico, and Chico is our master distiller. So uh, if everything tastes right and delicious, we can thank Chico. Um, so, so Chico. No, 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 you, 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 sorry, you have to, to, to thank uh, John. Uh, yeah, and well, well <laughs> as, as I said that, I thought that I, it occurred to me immediately that you would probably <laughs> correct me there, so I'm glad you did. Um, and then I'll just do a, a little bit of admin. I'm sure you've all got your tasting set, so I've already got into mine. But we've got we've got four bottles, as you can see within. But there's also tucked behind. You should have this mat, um, which doubles up as a pretty cool Oxford Rye little poster. But um, on this side. Um, quite self-explanatory, but I'll talk you through it anyway. You can place all the appropriate bottles in the appropriate place so that heritage grain can go on the grain section. The new make, and we'll talk about what new make is if you're not sure if that's confusing, um, goes in the new make, the Oxford Rye, and then the Oxford Rye Whiskey Batch 4, the graduate, that, that goes on the last along. And then if you have a nice whiskey glass with you, I urge you to use it. Uh, we've got Glen Cairns here, but and you've got a nice space there. But um, I think that if, if everyone's, we're all met and we're all happy, we can, we can make a start. Let's go, okay, let's go for it. So, I mean, the, the basic structure, although um, talking with Chico and John, as I often do, we will go off in amazing tangents that hopefully fit your questions, but the basic structure is centered around the bottle. So I, I thought we'd start um, by talking about the, the, the one bottle you can't drink. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give um, probably John the talky stick, but Chico as well. But uh, it says heritage grain here, and in case you don't know, we are distillers of heritage grain at the Oxford Arts Centre. We're very privileged to do it. And John is is our, our heritage grain guru. So maybe John, do you want to start by telling us what is heritage grain? What is heritage grain? First, I'd say you could crunch these. It's not going to kill you if you crunch a few between your teeth. You might have to. <laughs> I've never seen anyone do that. Um, but, you know, ideally, well, in Oxford, they are being turned into uh, into bread. So you could theoretically get a loaf made from that very grain you're crunching on the Ifley Road. I don't know if I can plug anyone exactly, but um, Hamblin Bakery doing a great job with it. But aside from that, so, um, uh, well, heritage grain to me, I like to equate the word. It, it's used a lot today. Everyone's using all sorts of terms, land races and heritage grains and regenerative agriculture. There's so many words that are floating around. Heritage to me basically means genetically diverse. And that's maybe a mouthful for some, but it means a lot. Because if you have a genetically diverse population of grain, that means it's resilient. And we're in a period, I think everyone realizes, of massive climate change, certainly massive unpredictability. And as a farmer, I'm seeing that all the time. So I've been working, and many others have been working for 20 years to try to create mixed populations of crops, completely different from the modern monocultures that we're using, which are basically every plant in the field's a clone, is, is absolutely identical. Well, in our fields, every plant in the field is different. And that diversity is rooted in genetic diversity. And that means that crop can take cold, wet, frost, drought, you name it, whatever the environment throws at it, better than any monoculture. So I needed a term to, instead of saying, you know, 
genetically diverse populations of ancient grains uh, well heritage so heritage to me is that shortcut heritage to many means just old you know we have english heritage and we have heritage cars and vintage cards mm. and all of that but to me the the, the huge decline the, well, there was a massive decline in the genetic diversity of our fields, whether that's wheat, rye, or, or any crop. Really, from in the early eight, from 1800 to 1850, 1860, but there were still mixed populations, which mean the word was is now used is the word land race, which means a genetically diverse population. But there were still some hanging around from about 1850 to 1900. But in 1900, they introduced intensive scientific plant breeding because they began to understand the laws of genetics mendel's laws of genetics so they started hybridizing crops to create the modern crops we have now today the monoculture the dwarf hybrids we have well dwarfing came in a bit later so they would purify those um, lines genetic lines so that every plant in the field was identical so to me heritage is pre hybridization so effectively in the uk for wheat it's pre-1900 wheats so anything before that they could still be not as diverse as i want from let's say 1860 i'm really trying to create these very very mixed populations so heritage is pre-hybrid and it means a genetically diverse population rather than a monoculture i hope that and wasn't so long of a mouthful there that was a pretty pretty good start though but you know heritage grain I've discovered in my journey working with you is something I understand more and more talking to you each time, but I think that was a pretty good start of the One thing I was, I was going to just draw everyone's attention to is John's use of the word population, because I think it's a very helpful word uh, when you think about how heritage grain works. What, what, and John, you correct me and, and heckle me and tell me I'm wrong, but what I think we, we're saying with a population is, 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 is like us, instead of having a clone or some kind of, you know, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think some dystopian reality where you've got a hundred of the same things. You have uh, different grains with different personalities. And I mean, uh, it leads quite well actually to give Chico the talky stick. Those different personalities can come through. I mean, we've got two major reasons why we use the grain. And I mean, there's lots of other ones, but in my mind, it's the environment, it's super sustainable, but then also they taste amazing. So Chico, I mean, can you speak on, on that? that? Yeah, the, I mean, it's, uh, it's, I'll just like uh, mention that uh, it's just beautiful to look into this bottle and, and see the just the differences between all these grains i mean um of course we 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 grow everything as a, as a population and populations they are dynamic they are always evolving um i mean john john is like uh he's constantly like studying like how, how like the, the population evolves and adapts to the field and like from year to year like uh, varieties that disappear and then that that uh, come up uh, through through, through cross pollination and in in this bottle you can see like a, a lot of like different uh, rye grains uh, different sizes colors um, and wheat as well so John should, should correct me if I'm wrong but um, this this was all, all grown together as as a mazing a mazing being being a, a, a mix between wheat and, and rye and um, just by mixing these uh, populations of wheat and rye together, um, the, there is a, a synergy uh, going on uh, between bo both, uh, both species and, and uh, the, the, the field is, is just healthier. Um, I'm just going to, Chico, I'm going to quickly do our, hopefully our audience a quick service because um, I'm going to highlight when, when words that we repeat are important. Maslin there, don't let that slip under the carpet. That's a very important concept and that's when we grow rye and wheat together. So not only do you have genetic variety, you also have cereal or grain variety within the, the same pitch. Sorry for interrupting you, Chico. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. Um, yeah, and I mean, the, just, just having different, different uh, uh, varieties of, of grains growing together in the field also really uh, influence how, how the, the, the spirits taste. Um, not only the spirits, but, but uh, any beer that will be brewed with these grains, the bread that is, is, is baked uh, from these grains. Um, it's just like a very complex uh, and complete uh, you know, flavor. Um, for example, we're going we're gonna to go through the, the, I mean, the, the, the liquids here, but we, we can feel like some, 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 some freshness, some herbalness, and, and as well as like creamy and, and chocolatey notes. So the, there's like a full spectrum of flavors from these grains that uh, really um, help um, us, I mean, as distillers, uh, in, in doing great, great tasting experience. 
I would, you know, can I just, I'm going to throw something out. I, when you were talking, Charlie, I was thinking how to visualize that diversity. And, you know, most of us, most people are not that familiar with grain. Wheat is wheat, rye is rye. Most people can't even tell the two of those apart. Uh, I mean, in the past, everyone was probably quite familiar with it. But if you think of this bottle, and as Chico said, you can see different sizes, different colors. The wheat is the golden colored rounder one, and the, and the rye is a slightly gray looking kind of torpedo shaped grain but the point is that every one of those is genetically very different so really if you could if this bottle was humans you could you know the parallel would be you've got an auditorium with 800 people in it but and every human in that auditorium is a bit different aren't they everybody looks a bit different different color eyes different color skin as opposed to a room that only had people with blonde hair and blue eyes you know that's what a modern monoculture is and this is a uh, 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 you know, a community of crops that are going to learn to grow together and they're going to adapt to the local growing environment to contribute to that flavor and, and just survive well and have a good yield, but contribute to the flavor as Chico was explaining. They're all pulling, you know, in different directions. One variety might do well, one might not, but they all, that all contributes to a successful crop. That is the basis of flavor in terroir in, in my view. Yeah, and it's just like natural selection from year to year. Like the, mm -hmm. the nature and the climate will select the the, the varieties that uh, will prefer to grow uh, under those conditions. Actually, there, there's another. Maybe that's where my analogy breaks down, as they often do. Is that when people think about a crop adapting, um, if, if you use this parallel if we're adapting to the hot weather of portugal or living in the arctic we're going to either put a jumper on or take it off whereas when we talk about a crop adapting because there's all this diversity some of those lines will do better and contribute more seed and as you say that's natural selection evolution so getting back to the science that's what this is really it's about population genetics and it's not it's not a challenging concept really is that those varieties that are best adapted are going to contribute more to the next um, generation and so on and so on and because well rye cross pollinates wheat self pollinates but basically you get these these well adapted evolutionarily well adapted populations that like growing in the Oxford region I, I, I really like the fact that um, I was lucky enough to, to get also um, a, a, a bit batch, of batch. <laughs> uh, which, 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 which grows as well in, in the fields um, Part of the community, isn't it? Yes, yeah, definitely part, part of the population. I don't know if anyone can detect, Charlie can probably detect the flavor of that individual vetch grain in a bottle, can't you, Charlie? I'll do my best. I'll definitely do my best. <laughs> but, um, I was going to say that that opens another kind of wider thing. You know, we're talking about diversity, um, which is a, 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 a 21st century concept in a very good way, and it's a positive thing. But talking, um, you're saying there's a, you're identifying that in there, Chico. It's worth saying, you know, we let our fields, our fields grow six foot tall, sometimes taller, they're taller than me. Um, and we let animals, wildlife live in there. And if there, there are, you know, weeds is already a word with a, with a connotation. So I'm, but if there are other plants growing in there, that, that's, that's still part of that community, that diversity that, that, that John's, the magic of your fields. Is, is that, would you say that's right, John? Well, yeah, my, well, I mean, I, I got them going, but I suppose it's nature that's now setting the pace and setting the tone. I mean, modern agriculture is about wiping out the existing ecosystem to death by spraying it with glyphosate and plowing it and getting rid of the competition in all weeds and other plants, and then putting in a modern hybrid that we control that grows only with lots of nitrogen and sprays and everything else. Our approach is not is just to manipulate the natural ecosystem well it's an agro ecosystem it's a farmed ecosystem it's clearly dominated by humans but trying to make it as natural as possible and adapting the crops to that so not by selecting the super high yielding dwarf varieties that require all those inputs but by choosing these old very tall varieties as you say six seven foot tall varieties that actually grow with very little nitrogen but they grow really reliably and they all pull together and, you know, we can produce a ton and a half, 1.4 tons. An organic farm will produce 1.8 tons, but we can get that every year if we grow it in the same field, if we have a really healthy, thriving ecosystem. So we're just really kind of manipulating the agro ecosystem, manipulating that field to skim off a little bit of grain and everything else stays in the field. The straw, not the only thing that comes off of that field to make our spirits is the grain. Yeah, and everything else, just, 
Yeah, everything is you know breaking down. We're sequestering massive amounts of carbon. We're feeding the soil because it's all about the soil life. If you want, you know, if you plow a field, it's obviously going to kill everything. So we need, you know, feed the soil, which will feed the plant. But choose the plants that are best adapted to live in those lower nitrogen input conditions. And I think that contributes a lot to flavor. We're not pushing the system to get three, four, five tons an acre or three, three and a half tons an acre as a conventional farmer would do. We're, we're happy to get one and a half. That's actually pretty good. And if you think about it, in an organic farming system, you get one crop of wheat, let's say, well, be, being nice, we'll give it two tons, 1.8 to two tons um, in a good year. But they can only grow that once every five years because they're still obsessed with building nitrogen, plowing it into the ground, spreading manure, you know, having a clover grass lay. Well, one crop every five years isn't really going to feed people either. And and I don't even think that study will produce good tasting spirits. Uh, whereas we can do one and a half tons every year. If you add that up, it's three times the organic yield. And all we're doing is playing with nature, manipulating a little bit, allowing these six foot, seven foot tall crops to do their thing and let nature sort out its own ecosystem in a sense. We've got a quick question from someone who has asked, uh, do, you have, do you have any appreciation of the number of genetic varieties of rye um, that goes into the rye spirit? Or do you have an appreciation of the, of the genome of your field? That's a fun question. That that's really at the core of what interests me so much. I'll tell you what. Yesterday, I had a meeting with someone from uh, a university. We're starting a DNA analysis project, um, looking at the genetic diversity in the ancient thatch, where a lot of this project started when I was working in Oxford. Um, but in the existing fields, well, the difference is wheat self-pollinates. So if you plant 500 types of wheat and you grow them for one year, maybe 50 don't like the weather in Oxford. So you'll end up with 450. They don't cross with each other. They don't make new types. Almost never. You have to force them to hybridize. Rye cross pollinates, like maize, for example. So the pollen blows around. It's wind pollinated. So if I plant, well, you know, what did I start with? Actually, I had seed from all over Scandinavia, from Canada, from villages in Turkey where I'd worked as an archaeologist, from gene banks from all over the world. I brought them all together. So from the very beginning, they were very genetically diverse populations. People, modern farming, there are modern rye varieties, but they're difficult because they cross so much and they don't stay true and they're obsessed with this purity. The short answer is no. But I'll tell you, I think our rye is the most, I put it up to be the most genetically diverse cereal crop. I'm saying that very slow and, you know, can I justify it? Yes. The most genetically diverse cereal crop that I'm aware of anywhere. Uh, there may be land race. Well, even land races in obscure parts of, they're still growing them in a rare part of Turkey, for example. I think that's they're pretty much all gone. Um, but they would still be narrowly adapted. We're starting with, with a massive amount of diversity to begin with, and every year they're crossing and crossing and crossing and creating even more diversity. So it's they're impossible. hugely diverse. Well, how to quantify that? My, my first question would be, why would I care to quantify that? It seems very reductionist and scientific. Well, you know, we need numbers. We need to say how many types you have in there. Well, it's about splitting hairs, isn't it? You know, it, you're going to end up with, you know, are you looking at one slight difference in allele? frequency i mean like is it like where where do you end your division so it, okay, hugely let's have a qualitative answer and we'll just use the word lots <laughs> <laughs> lots i like the word it's a black box but i don't mind dealing with a black box i think science has a problem with having to name and number and quantify everything but what we know is we have a genetically diverse population that is cross-pollinating, that is extremely diverse, and because it's diverse, it is adapting and evolving to local conditions. I'm happy with that. It works. I know it works. It makes great spirits. It makes great flour. I never have a problem with disease. I, I have never had a crop failure. I've had human failures, but I haven't had crop failures. And we're in a difficult um, position in terms of climate. So we have to have resilience and adaptive crops. And I don't see that coming out of modern plant breeding. I don't think that's what modern agriculture is looking going on. And, you know, GM is just a, another step towards, uh, it's another breeding technique that is increasing genetic uniformity. It's, it's, it's hyper monoculture. 
uh, you know, aside from any dangers associated with it. So it's just another step on that breeding, that line of technologies. And I'm not against technology. I'm not against science. Clearly, I'm a scientist. But I think science has to serve humanity. And, and I think our plant breeding has been so dominated by industry and, and corporate breeding and the, yes, the Monsantos of the world. So, I, you know, I, I'm just doing what our ancestors did without thinking about it. All of our ancestors grew land races. We wouldn't be it's here. Good to have ancient, it's good to have ancient technologies brought back to the fore. It's really, uh, it's almost the future is the past, but yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, question's been re, the, the question's been rephrased for how many varieties do we start with? I'm gonna type that one in the box. But I'm conscious of time. There's some questions about the rye cross pollinating and how the kind of fields change over time, and just that change the flavour. I feel that might come up later, so let's keep that one in our minds. And um, how about we um, head back to Charlie? What I might do, what I might do, Dane, having worked in the booze industry for a while, is I feel slightly cruel to everyone staring at these bottles now. So I think uh, everyone, you can pour yourself a drink now, uh, and you've done very yeah, well. Please. Um So we're going to start with the new make spirit and, and new make. I mean, it, it's almost what it says in the title. It's it's what it's whiskey before you've touched any barrel. Uh, and I do a little bit of whiskey basics here. Chico won't believe that I'm saying this. It's his second nature. But you know, spirits. No spirit ever comes off a still with color. That's worth noting. A spirit is always is always colorless. And so when you have whiskey of this color, that comes from from a barrel, from a cask. That's the word we tend to use more in the industry. But it's 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 worth almost saying that the barrel or the the cask is not just a container. It's an ingredient. It's a live chemical reactor. Um, but I'm going on about cast while we all drink something that's had no cast. So I won't witter on more. What I'll do is I'll hand over to Chico um, and we can talk. I think I think we should talk about the flavors of our new make and then and then how that how you when you make a whiskey, do you think about how the flavor of the new make is going to change in a barrel? Maybe we could talk about that a bit, Chico. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. I mean. I'd just like to say that um, for us, it's uh, working with John and uh, these amazing grains. Um, it just put us a lot of pressure on us to, to, to try to do the, the best we can with the grains and to, to, to glorify and celebrate the, the, the diversity of the grains and how uh, good uh, heritage grains are uh, for the world. And um, I mean, in the city, what, what we do is we, we eternalize the, the crop. The, the grain. Um, so, I mean, the grain might go off after a few years, uh, but whiskey doesn't. And whiskey usually just gets better with, with age, uh, even in a, in a bottle. I mean, it's, um, it's a mixture uh, of uh, water, alcohol or ethanol, and a lot of flavor molecules. And all of them are reacting with each other. The water with, with the ethanol, with the with the, the, the all the hundreds of uh, flavor molecules that uh, is contained in this liquid. So, yeah, I mean the new the new make is uh, is produced from um, uh, uh, milling the grain, uh, cooking the grain to, to convert all the starch into sugars, so that the yeast can can ferment can consume the sugars to produce um, alcohol and also some other flavors. Um, and depending of the, the type of sugars that the, the, the yeast consume from the grain, also will um, the, the yeast will produce different flavors. So, uh, in, 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 in some ways, uh, the grain expresses itself all the way down to the to, to, to the bottle. Um, and so, what do we do with distillation? Distillation is just a simple process of uh, separating two. Uh, compounds and in this case we are separating um, ethanol from, from from water but it's a little bit more complex than that because um, there's so much reaction going on in the steel uh, I mean there is heat uh, there is uh, um, liquid uh, evaporating and then condensing back uh, in, in, into, into, into into liquid um, and all that impacts the flavor of the uh, of the of the spirits, and um, so the, this new make that we have in front of us, it's uh, pretty much uh, the same as this bottle when it comes to the recipe. So this bottle, um, it's uh, it's a mazen that contains around like seventy percent rye and thirty percent wheat. We do use a little bit of malted barley to to allow the enzymes uh, converting the starch into into sugars. Um, but then, like, the, 
we, we end up with this. And uh, this is double distilled um, in, in, a, in, in Nautilus, our, our main uh, copper still. And um, I mean, the, the, the flavors that, uh, that this new make has in, um, in the liquid, um, they, they just, they're kind of like the, the, the base, um, a little bit like, like this, the, the, all the, the kind of like the raw ingredients. So the cask will, um, through time, and uh, will uh, react with all these flavors, all this liquid over, and we'll, uh, we'll change it to, to something, um, I mean, in, 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 our, in our opinion, way, way better. Um, I mean, the, the, there's like oxidation going on, there's evaporation through the, through the woods. Uh, so as, as, as Charlie mentioned, the, the gas is, is, is a dynamic bio, bio reactor. In, in this way but um but this new make it's um i don't know what you guys um feel this 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 uh I was say also, also to the to, to, to everyone listening that the, the new make in a distillery a lot often you'll get the real whiskey nerds um want to try the new make it's almost a joke um you get a whiskey nerd looking around your distillery they go um because it, it's a really what sorry i'm didn't give you the end of that thought, but it's a really good way to um, get the personality of the distillery because this is this is straight off the still, um, and it, it gives you a good, good indication of what the whiskey style and the distillery style really is, and what's coming from the cask and what's coming from the barrel. I hope that makes sense. I was also um, Chico and Dane. I hope you don't object. There's a question that's come in that we can do quite quickly um, about the ABV of our new make. Um, mm -hmm. This is at forty-seven percent, and you're, you're absolutely right, uh, sir. Yeah, guessing that, that some water has been added. Um, Chika, could you, the question is, uh, how, what proof or how, how strong is our new make whiskey when it comes off the stove? So, all starts um, fermenting the grains and the grains uh, will ferment uh, to around seven to 10% um, ABV. And then we will distill it once into low wines and that will be around 35%. Um, and when we distill the second time, uh, when you get the, the, the new make, um, will be between um, well, we start definitely like at 90 uh, and can go all the way down to 65. Um, we usually like split um, the spirit that comes out of the steel in three different parts, the, the so-called hearts, uh, heads and tails. Um, heads is the first part and usually it's when, when all the methanol and not good uh, flavors come up in the beginning. Uh, but that's just like a very small percentage. And then hearts will come and hearts are basically the, the good tasty stuff that, uh, that we are here enjoying. Uh, and then as the, the, the alcohol uh, comes out of the still and goes down in percentage, we start to, to extract a lot of water and, um, and oils. Um, and that's, that's called the tails, uh, very waxy stuff. Of course, the heads and tails we, we don't use um, to, to, to the new make or to, to blend with the new make, but it, it's uh, redistilled really over and over because there's a lot. So, I mean, it, 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 it's so hard to produce all this alcohol that we don't want to waste it at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, this one was alluded to 47%, uh, just so it could be uh, easier to, 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 to enjoy it. Um, of course, new make uh, might might uh, feel a, a little bit rough, a little bit raw, um, not so not so great to, to, to enjoy. That's why we, we put it in a cask. Um, so it, so it, it definitely evolves and develops uh, in, a, in a nice way. But um, but yeah, Charlie, you were totally right that um, that uh, new make it's it's probably like the one of the best ways to express. The, the work um, of the of the distillery um, usually because the, the during the maturation in the casks everything happens uh, and the the flavors can really go in several directions um, so the spirit just straight out, out, out of the still really shows the, the the character of the of the of the grain of the the, the fermentation the fermenters as well um, and the character of, of the the still um, I mean. This, this new make, for example, it's, it's very, very herbal. Um, it's very kind of like refreshing, herbal, a little bit floral. And that's definitely um, a classic character from, from Rye Grey. Um, and uh, our rye, um, compared with, um, with the other, other rye spirits, it's usually like very, very fresh, very herbal. Um, but then like 
there's a lot of like other flavors like it's it's a little bit creamy um that usually comes from from the the, the fermentation with lactic acid bacteria uh some bacteria that's that's that ferment cheese or, or yogurt um kefir um but also it's kind of like, like chocolatey as well and that chocolateiness um comes from 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 the grain from the wheat from from the barley a little bit from the rye um but in this film for example we 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 dist we distill with the grain in, so basically we, we heat up a, a, a big a big volume of porridge, um, and the, the, the steel is heated with a steam coil um, internally. And uh, imagine that rye is it's very very viscous because uh, it has a lot of protein, uh, which uh, contributes to to the, to the viscosity of, of liquid. Uh, so the porridge. Uh, it just doesn't move, and we have a, a quite powerful uh, agitator in the steel. Uh, but, but by just not moving, the the porch bakes around the um, the, the coils, and um, that gives a kind of like a smoky uh, character, a little bit like a burnt toast uh, or like a overcooked uh, sourdough uh, crust, and that's that's definitely uh, uh, noticeable in our Oxford rye whiskey. Um, so. I mean, in the new make, this new make, it's um, you, you can see that it's, it's quite complex. It's quite uh, it's quite quite a lot of flavors in here. But all these flavors, what what they need is um, reacting with them, reacting with the with the, the compounds in the in the woods, uh, the tannins, the wood sugars, um, reacting with the oxygen, um, or and I mean just so. A cask, it's it's just a, a living system, and um, I mean the cask can, can taste amazing today and tomorrow be a little bit nasty, just because it's always evolving. Um, and uh, I mean one of the, the one of one of the examples that I I, I, I like to explain how, how things can really react and evolve is uh, is with um, butyric acid and ethanol. So butyric acid is, is, a, is a flavor compound that uh, it's, it, it's the flavor compound that tastes like puke, vomit, um, and it's disgusting, of course. No one Surely not in our, in our spirits. Um, and it's usually, usually produced by, 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 by yeast and bacteria during the fermentation. Um, but then when uh, butyric acid uh, React and combines with uh, a, an ethanol creates ethyl butyrate, and ethyl butyrate is the flavor compound for pineapple flavor. So we, I mean, usually we, we joke in, in the industry that uh, we promote every, we do every as every single thing to to to, to create uh, vomit flavor. So then, in a couple of years, we have pineapple flavor in the whiskey. <laughs> um, so it's understanding all this this flavor. I'm not sure that's helping the marketing, Chico. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, no, no. It's. Uh, it's if, the best I guess we could say if anyone <laughs> back home, if anyone back home said vomit, well, it's going to be delicious in a couple of years. Don't worry, that's you're saying the right thing. You know, I just had a, a, a maybe a mad idea. You got a little jar. Everybody's got a little jar of this mixed grain. Now that's probably closest, I would say, to what you'll ever find, or would have found in a field of medieval wheat in let's say 1450. That's what you have in your bottle. Now, if you want to taste what porridge tastes like, or perhaps some sort of flatbread, you could take that grain. It's all edible. Uh, you could put it in your coffee grinder. Uh, or if you have a little mill or even grind it with a, well, I don't know how many people have a corn, but a mortar and pestle, you could theoretically create a bit of a flour, maybe sieve off the big bitch or let it sit and let it ferment if you, if anybody makes sourdough bread and make the world's smallest pancake or crepe or, 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 or something that would rise a little bit. And you would have the flavor of the grain that came out of the field. Uh, we have heated it up slightly, make sure it was dry and everything to put in the bottle. But basically, you've got that maslin that people ate, which was the standard. But all my research on this ancient medieval thatch, and I've looked at 200 samples of medieval wheat and only about 250, I think, in the country. And almost all of them are maslin of some sort that are in the base coats of these medieval buildings. So you've got this opportunity to look at maslin and then to drink the maslin, to eat the maslin and to drink the maslin in that jar. 
Well, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely say that um, for the for the for the people that's uh, it's into, into sardo making at home, um, our Mazin also it's a great um, the great starter um, because uh, as as we don't we don't uh, use any chemicals in the field we don't we don't plow and we promote the the the, the healthiest ecosystem um, the. The microflora that uh, our grain has naturally has. Uh, it's 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 great to 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 start uh, uh, start to start to 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 ferment uh, to ferment bread. And you're not going to get that on a monoculture that's been sprayed six times in the season with fungicides, are you? Yeah, no, definitely. No. <laughs> Guys, I I don't know. Um, I, I've got a, I've just a few thoughts, but we might have some questions as well coming. I don't know, Dave. One thought I wanted to just point out. Um, I'm doing a sort of the, gen the more general whiskey chair. Is um, if you didn't notice, Chico talked and explained that whiskey comes out the still at 90%, and we proof it down to 47, like we have with the new make and our whiskeys. And the reason I say that is, if there's anyone in the crowd who's got very strong opinions about adding water to whiskey, I, with with the greatest respect, think you um, need to reconsider your strong opinion because we in the distillery and in every distillery in the world add water to whiskey. No one buys whiskey at 89%. So if anyone's ever been rude to someone and said, you must never add water to whiskey, you, you, you've got to think of it as relative. If you buy whiskey at 64%, which you can, you should probably add water to it unless it drinks beautifully at 64. If you buy whiskey at 35%, then they do exist. Maybe you don't need to add water to it. But it's not really this kind of moral or judgmental thing as it sometimes has been in, in popular culture. And I think that's worth uh, saying. And then the other thing I just want to say is, on the side of your of, of your tasting pack is, is a picture of our still. So um, Chico was describing that's Nautilus, there's Nemo, our littler still. Um, but if you imagine exactly though, that, that, that is exactly what it looks like, but for 2,200 litres. Um, bigger. Yeah, <laughs> a bit bigger. Um, do come visit us in Oxford, we love showing it off. We built our still with um, the South Devon Railway. Uh, so it's, it's pretty unique actually, we love showing it off. I, I also think, Dane, I, I don't know if you're, if you're thinking we should do a, a question or two. I definitely think we should get into the next drink or the next spirit, which is... Let's taste the barrel, yeah, let's taste the barrel. <laughs> yeah, so the, 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 this one is quite, quite a unique experience. Um, and um, this uh, Oxford Rye, it's, it's basically just the name. Um, it, it cannot be called whiskey because it's only matured for three months. And um, um, this, this comes from the, the early uh, stage of the company that uh, we were doing a lot of gin, a lot of vodka. We were doing some whiskey uh, to, to, to bring casks, but we definitely were missing to have some whiskey to drink. Um, so we uh, fully kind of broke down the process of, the, of uh, producing a new make uh, for, to, for whiskey. Um, and instead we uh, optimize uh, every single stage so we could produce the most enjoyable uh, new make um, that, that will need less time in a barrel to, to be pleasant to, to enjoy. So this Oxford rye, it's the, the, the purest expression of our rye grain our rye populations, because it's 100% rye. Um, of course, I mean, several, several varieties of rye going, going, going together, uh, but- um, several, several and several, I think several is down Several back. thousand, I would Several think. thousand, yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, also, um, I'm gonna highlight, we're moving away from Maslin, everyone. I'm going back on me yeah. now. So, so yeah, this, this is Can like, um, a little bit, I guess, our kind of diversity uh, either. But uh, of course, the, divers, the, the diversity here, it's through the right population. Um, so it's 100% it's, uh, it's right. 20% uh, of this rye is malted. Uh, so again, we have the, the enzyme uh, uh, power to convert all the starch into sugars. Um, and then it's distilled in a very delicate way. Uh, where we just uh, run the distill very low and just select the, the liquid that we really, really enjoy uh, to consume at the time. Um, so basically the new make of this Oxford Rye, it's, it's delicious. Uh, whereas this new make has a lot of other flavors like mm -hmm. harshness that once in a cask, after three, four years, will evolve in a very beautiful way and create a lot of mouthfeel. Um, yeah, this definitely is very fruity. Um, 
And uh, it just sit in the cast for three months. Um, and during these three months, what we wanted is just a little bit of the, the, the flavor from the, from the oak. Uh, it's fully matured in American oak. American oak usually gives a lot of like vanilla and coconut flavors. But this, uh, this, this rye, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's, it has, it's, 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 I mean, yeah, it's very fruity. Uh, it has some, some melon. It has uh, a lot of caramel notes, uh, mm. kind of like a butterscotch or like Weathers original. Um, it's very weathery original. That's right. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's also quite smooth. Um, mm. I think it's always quite interesting. I don't know. We've definitely got um, a scientific-minded uh, audience. But if we've got the whiskey nerds out there, you know, rye whiskey generally the, the the first adjective you'll ever hear from someone talking about rye whiskey is spicy. But mm. I think we we could all agree that the most the most rye-y, if you'll forgive that word, expression on the on the map is not particularly spicy. Uh, it's it's actually very sweet. I remember when when Corey and Chico and I, uh, Corey, the the uh, former master, and we all. Uh, distilled this we, we're saying we need to tell john heritage grain is so sweet when it comes off the still it um it, it it you know in a way that when you talk about rye normally it's sweetness is not the first adjective um i, I don't know chico and john what you make of that but or sweet is a bit of an, a lazy adjective on my behalf i'm sure she can give much more uh, uh beautiful and elaborate tasting those yeah oh, yeah absolutely i mean it's uh, just grain is so so sweet um, and all, all our spirits are kind of like sweet because of the grain. Um, of course, uh, over, uh, during the maturation in, in a barrel, um, the liquid will extract also the wood sugars, uh, lactones. But um, but yeah, the, 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 when, it, when you try the new make, you can definitely feel the feel the, the sweetness in there. Um, but yeah, uh, rye. It's uh, it's uh, a very. I mean, we, we love rye. We, and, but, but why we love rye? I mean, rye is it's so complex when it comes to flavors. Of course, wheat, barley, oats, they, they, they're, they're beautiful grains. And we also, I mean, we love all the grains. Um, uh, I mean, we, we love, it's like we love all, 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 all our, <laughs> and corn, all, yeah. our siblings. It's like, it's like there is no preference. But, um, but rye, it's, uh, it has, uh, as you said, Charlie, it's, uh, it can be very spicy, it can express notes of uh, of uh, pepper like black pepper session pepper um it can be also quite anise it can be it can also have some some christmas spices which this also right definitely has a lot of christmas spices like mm. like nutmegs and cloves um cinnamon and uh, that's um there's a combination between again flavors from grain uh that's went through all the process of producing the new make and the flavors from from, from the task yeah, I, I want to say it's really good to just jump in. Sorry, it's really good to taste um, the new make and then have the barrel version of it straight away. It's it's you don't often get that chance to kind of compare across the process. And there's I, a question, in the, oh, sorry, a couple of questions in the box about how do you compare across the year. So people will be familiar with. Um, I mean, it's possibly more popular with champagnes, for instance, sort of vintage, non-vintage, that kind of idea, and how. Uh, vintage years, you know, champagne houses will kind of go, this is the 2012 version, and it was a brilliant, or this is the 2008 version, this is a really top-notch year. There's a, question, a couple of questions in the Q&A about sort of the the flavours changing, and I suppose the flavours of the new make changing, and also consequently of the rye, once you put it in the barrels, how does that, how does that track over time? Can you talk about that a bit? Can, I, can yeah. I say something on that first? Oh, sorry, Chico, go ahead. No, I was go, just going to say, it's you know, it starts with the grain and then all the potential things that could influence it year by year with what you do. So there's so many things that come together to produce that flavor, isn't there? So I, I don't know if I explained, I maybe not, didn't explain it clear enough, but because the question says, if rye is cross-pollinating at such a significant rate, does this prevent challenges in consistency of flavor? Well, to me, they're they're all pushing towards the mean, if you see what I mean. They're they're a it's a buffered system. So, if you really do want the true expression of the very light sandy soil in Tiddington outside of Oxford, as opposed to the stone brash of West Oxfordshire, for example, um, if you have that enormous pile of genetic diversity, those that are best adapted will contribute. So gradually they'll evolve. Yes, they will be. Uh, you'll have a, a kind of a distinctive, genetically distinctive 
population growing in those areas. And that's going to produce, to some degree, a, a, a distinctive flavor of Yonir. They'll move a little bit. They're adapting and they're evolving. But I think that's where the true flavor of the locality comes from. If you take a modern monoculture that is grown literally all over the country, that's designed for growing in every soil with lots of fertilizer, and it grow, you plant some in the west coast of Wales and East Anglia with very different growing conditions. One does well, presumably the one in East Anglia would do better, and the one in the west coast of Wales doesn't do very well at all. You're going to get a different flavor. Is that real terroir or is that a failure of a variety? To, that it's not adapted to the local conditions. If you want to draw out true flavor in terroir and have consistency in that, you're never going to have it identical. But we don't want it the same. But, you know, in, in diversity there is flavor, in diversity there is strength from year to year. So in, in, in diversity it, there is beauty. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so yes, exactly. It, it is a spice of life, you could say. Anyway, um, so you've got, you've got, you've got, you know, uniformity with the possibility of change. I suppose what you're doing. So we're not trying to have a uniform product that's absolutely identical every time, like the, like the champagnes. You can't because you have maybe a mixture of grapes or different types of grapes. So that that can attribute to that. But basically, um, but every, every, every it's year, not a challenge. Be that's my different. that's my farming view. But Chico, you know, you go ahead. Sorry. No, no. I mean, you're totally right. I mean, every year the the, the, the crop will be different. Uh, the population will be in a different state. There'll be different varieties. Uh, the grain conditions will be different. I mean, uh, and that's that's how we get the villages. Uh, the harvest will be always different. So um, it's it's really impossible to 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 keep consistency um, through batches uh, without a facility. But um, what we are focused on is to to always deliver a consistent quality of, of spirits. That's what we we I usually uh, play with the with the guys in the facility, saying that uh, that uh, whatever we we do next needs to be at least better than, than we did in the past. You, you know, I, can I just say, I, I think if I'm, again, from the grain side, that I have more consistency of quality of flour, I'm talking for grain for baking. I mean, the next step is transforming it to booze. But I have more consistency of quality and flavor in my flour than modern varieties because they're so reactive to changing weather conditions. They're developed to grow in perfect conditions, which we're not getting. Therefore, I have, you know, my, my protein levels or, or whatever flavor levels, I think are more consistently high every year, year on year, because it's a buffered system with lots of resilience and lots of diversity. And that's going to carry over in the flavor of the whiskey in exactly the same way, I would think. Yeah, so no, I mean, have more stable, high quality flavor from year to year than someone who uses a monoculture who's growing it, you know, the same one every year, but the weather is really terrible one year for, for a variety. And, you know, is that really, you know, it, 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 might, be, it might be terrible for, for, uh, for, 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 I mean, it might be like the, 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 the worst, uh, crop mm. ever, or the worst harvest ever, but, uh, the flavor of the, of the, of those grains might be very good. I mean, for example, um, uh, the vines, they, they need to suffer a little bit to produce the best grapes, the most sweet and flavorful grapes. And a little bit uh, in, in, the, in whiskey, for example, um, I mean, there's a difference between um, like whiskey done with, with, more, uh, with modern uh, farmed, uh, conventional farmed uh, grains uh, to the whiskey that is uh, um, Produced from organic grains because uh, organic grains usually will be more dense and in, packed with flavor. But then, like, there's a whole like new bridge to to heritage grains because uh, of the, the development of the elf uh, of the field. So it's the the, the flavor the, that uh, that goes into the grain, the, the, all, all the grainies when it comes to like uh, carbohydrates, proteins, all that would be totally different from from uh, from organic or uh, conventional organic and conventional uh, conventional farm grains. So, I mean, it's but then like when when you you translate that in a distillery, there's so many other varieties. Um, uh, Very Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just endless the 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 the, the flavor 
uh, capability or the, the diversity in this case is uh, uh, what we we like to do in the distillery is building a library of flavors that then you can play with. That's why um, we work with different grains, we make with different yeasts, uh, different times, we use in different ways, um, and then we mature the new makes um, in different casts as well. Um, I mean, in, in American oak, in French oak, in the, in Portuguese chestnuts um, casks, in the, in the wine casks from I mean from sherry, port, Madeira, uh, white wine casks. Um, just so the the flavors uh, in the cask they, they really mingle with the flavors in, in the spirits. And answering to 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 to, to, to Dane's question, um, how we track. Um, the, the flavor development is really maturation. Um, it just takes a lot of sampling, which is always yeah. a good thing. I mean, it's always, it's always good to open a cask uh, and see the, how, how the cask is going. Um, and uh, there, there's always ups and downs, as I, as I, as I mentioned before. Um, there's, um, I mean, the, the cask has, is always evolving because the cask is, is not just a container, as Charlie mentioned. Uh, it's it's porous. Uh, there is uh, um, liquid evaporating through the wood. There is um, air coming through the wood and and uh, blending with the liquid. Uh, there is all the chemistry uh, going on around the liquids. Uh, the, the 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 molecules of the wood. Uh, um, getting infused uh, in liquid and reacting with the liquids, um, so it's always, always, always changing. Uh, we do keep uh, a lot of samples in, in our lab from uh, from the same cask um, throughout the years, um, and they're so different. I mean, from from each other. Um, usually, uh, the liquid starts quite quite raw it starts to get a little bit of color uh after a couple of months uh, a little bit a little bit sweeter but then like if we taste the cask in winter will be so different from the the flavors that the cask will have in the summer just because uh depending on the temperature and the humidity the the, the liquid might expand and contract inside the cask might m uh, migrate in and out of the woods um so it's also very important to keep an eye on the cask to 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 see what the best time to harvest the liquid is, um, and um, I mean this was uh, when we were just about to release uh, our first whiskey. Uh, people people were like, "Oh, I mean it's three years, we should be ready, no?" Um, and that doesn't that doesn't work like that. I mean the the, the whiskey is ready when when it's, it tastes good. Uh, it's just not being like three three years in one day. Uh, so it can be called whiskey, that the whiskey is ready to, to be enjoyed. No, I mean, it might need like 10, 20 years uh, in, in some cases. Uh, uh, they definitely have like 50-year-old uh, whiskeys. Uh, and all that comes with the with understanding the, um, how, how the flavors can react over time. Um, so, so yeah, we, we do sample a lot of, a lot of our casks. Right. I was going to actually say, I was just going to quickly, just a few things, John, and then I'll, I'll shut up again. I was just going to say, Dane made a pretty spot on point earlier, saying it's good to go back. A lot of, a lot of flavor discovery or whatever word you want to use is comparative. So having samples of how the cask was, flavor, I mean, I'd say even in a commercial sense, if you're uncomfortable when, and, you, and you don't know how to spend your money in whiskey, Try lots of different port cask finishes next to sherry cask finishes. Decide which one you like more there and then. Then you have an informed decision. You like sherry cask more than port cask. You can actually, you know, yeah, I'm also going to quickly do, because we're running out of bit of time. I think we should pour out um, batch four. People have been asking um, a lot about consistency. Um, and I understand the question. In fact, I relish it. But um, Emma, who asked, um, you know, will, it, will the whiskey taste significantly different? Or is that the plan? Well, you nailed it. That, that is very much the plan. You know, we, we, it's not just a kind of brand line. We embrace diversity in all senses. We, we want our whiskey to always be good, but always express the feel. And that sort of answers Richard Burkett's question. You, know, Richard, you were asking, you know, is the philosophy kind of more processed than flavor or is it 50-50? I, I, I'd say there's, I use a scientific word. The hypothesis is that they, they work together. Pro, the process and the flavor are complementary of one another. Um, you can decide if the hypothesis is correct. But that's what we're going for. And then we I'll always really shape the process to optimize the flavor uh, and the flavor from, from the grain, pairing that flavor from the grain uh, to the flavors from the process um, or the impact 
uh, of the process in the flavor and also the, 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 the maturation. So just like cooking, it's cooking in different spices, different seasonings. Oh, yeah. um, I was going to say also, I've got, I've got two more housekeeping ones and I'm off. Everyone pour out your batch. Actually, I've got three more, I'm afraid. People are asking about water. Now, water in whiskey is important, but to an extent, in the sense that when you were making a uh, single malt in Glen or Ben, you know, in a hidden valley, you wanted good quality water. Nowadays, you use reverse osmosis water. You, 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 the, you know, it's, it's treated in, in the Scotch distilleries as well as ours. So it's not a very romantic answer, but that is the answer, I'm afraid. Someone said that you don't use Thames water, do you? Well, in some ways we do, we, we treat it though. We, it's reverse osmosis is the process. Uh, there isn't a lock Thames that we can go on about, although some marketeer looking like me probably would if we could, but um, that, that's, the, that's the answer on that one. The other thing I was gonna say on consistency, I'm just getting these out and then I should go on mute again, guys, is um, you've got to remember in the whiskey industry, this isn't, this isn't just particular to us. Yes, we have more diversity to play with, but the master distiller is one role. Chico plays another role if, if we were a huge Scottish distillery house. He's master blender as well. Every barrel tastes different. Even if you have the exact same conditions, exact same barrel, you know, maybe one is nearer where the truck comes and vibrates every Wednesday morning. And so that causes more agitation. So that barrel has changed compared to its neighbor. So a master blender's job is to create consistency um, to an extent from, from lots of variables. So, so that's not actually that unheard of. I mean, you could quite rightly say to me in the chat, do you have loads and loads of variables? No, we don't have millions and millions of casks like a huge Scottish uh, uh, distillery does, but we, um, we have a few to play with and, and more and more is coming. Um, and I, I think that was pretty much it on my, um, on my house. Oh, and then the last thing I was gonna say is people are asking, you know, we're coming out batch by batch and we're on the fourth batch here, as you can see, it says batch four, but I'm kind of happy to announce, and this is one thing I can talk about, that we're gonna to change to named batches. So this. This batch is called The Graduate. Uh, it's our first named batch. Very Oxford. Very Oxford, but hopefully in, that, in doing that, you'll be able to sort of identify them with a proper noun and a proper name. And you could sort of, you know, if you are following this degree, firstly, thank you very much, but you can say, oh, I really thought this, this one was different from that one. And you don't have to kind of, in a linear way, uh, remember them. So I hope, I hope that helps and, and answers. Now I will go back on mute, but um, I'm gonna call myself some of The Graduate, our batch four. Yeah, no, this this graduate is is um, I mean it's uh, it's 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 our bigger blend of casks uh, since uh, we we started uh, re releasing some whiskey also because uh, we we're just like releasing like one cask here two casks over there and now we have like more casks to play with so this is a blend of six different casks and all American oak casks but different sizes different toasts. I mean, a cask is always um, toasted and charred inside. So you break down all like the cellulose um, into like uh, with sugars and uh, it, it's, it just develops the, the flavor uh, of the cask and also the, how the cask works the, the spirit as well. Um, but yeah, it's different sizes. Uh, um, different sizes mean that, that's, uh, that's um, for example, a smaller cask will have uh, more um, wood contacts uh, per liter uh, of whiskey. Um, and so also different casks from different um, cooperages. Um, I can say that uh, we, it's mainly two cooperages that went in, into this, this whiskey. And uh, the only difference between them um, is they are 50 miles apart. One is closer to the sea and one is more inland. And we could definitely taste the difference between, between them. Like, uh, because the, the the oak season it's a uh, it's um it's um slowly naturally uh, dry over like three years usually just to break down all this like uh, this wood structure as well and get so it'll be like softer um and the one by the sea was way really kind of like more refreshing uh, kind of character into the whiskey whereas the one more inland uh, get more kind of like bit fruit, fruity, like berry flavors. Um, so six different casks, um, different sizes, different toasts, um, different cooperages, and also matured in different environments. Um, so some matured in uh, in our distillery, which is uh, always like with a, the gate open and exposed to the to the weather conditions. Uh, I mean, to the to the cold cold winter, uh, to up to all the wind. Uh, blowing from Oxford City Centre all the way up to, to, to the top of South Park. Um, and so, some other casks matured in a cold, uh, um, 
cold dark warehouse uh, where, where we mature the majority of our whiskies. And all that impacts how the, 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 the liquid behaves inside the cask. Um, so all these six casks, they were very different in flavors. Um, and um, I mean, some were kind of like a little bit like smokier, others were like fruitier, others were like more kind of creamy. Um, but like blending all these casks, it just uh, created a very kind of like layered, uh, complex uh, whisk that we have in front of us. And it's called the graduate because I, we believe it's, it's Oxford Rye Whiskey after education. Um, and it's our fourth release. Um, and we just think that this is like kind of like our signature flavors uh, all year. And so it's Oxford Rye Whiskey uh, ready to be enjoyed. So. Yeah, cheers. cheers, guys. I was, I was also going to just say, I know, John, you wanted to say something a minute ago, but, but also handing over to John, grain-wise, um, we are back in Maslin again, guys. So we had, you know, the Maslin, the new maple was Maslin, and we had 100% rye, but this is made with Maslin, so John's populations of, of, of rye and wheat. Um, I, can, I can throw a tasting note in the, in the air that we haven't had yet that, that comes out from this place. It's very nutty, I think. You get sort of hazelnut notes. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very, very nutty. Um, I also feel this, this week is very creamy as well. And I think this, this nutty creaminess, this is also, I feel a little bit like dough, like fried dough, a little bit like pastry. Um, I usually like play like saying that this is like an almond croissant kind of thing. Um, kind of like praline yum yums. Uh, which I recently discovered so, with, with Charlie. Um, and uh, I mean, it's also very fruity. It's a very fruity whiskey. Uh, once we, we we have like a like a delicate uh, uh, sniff, I, it 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 uh, it's kind of like herbal and floral as well in some ways. It's like a little bit like anise seeds, um, a little bit. Uh, um, I mean, it's, it definitely expresses the the, the, the complexity of the grains. Um, but then it's it's quite. I mean, comparing this with the uh, Oxford Rye. And the new make, you can kind of understand that this is like way kind of like way developed, way richer. Uh, it has a, like a full mouthfeel. Uh, also, talking a bit, a bit of of, uh, of water here uh, as well. It's it's fifty one point three percent. So it's quite a high, uh, quite strong uh, spirits. Um, but we, we feel that at fifty one point three, it really. Um, tastes, uh, you can really taste pretty much everything. And uh, then being such a high, high strength, uh, you, you can just like add water to, to, to your preference because the water will uh, marry with, with the flavors and will allow the, the liquid to show different flavors. So it's definitely a very nice uh, whiskey to study um, over, over, over a long period uh, because uh, as you have like some drops of water, the, the, the flavors will start to pop up in different ways. Um, and also, I mean, it's, it's, it's great for cocktails as well. Um, I love cocktails and uh, this whiskey is definitely very good for that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's quite rich and, and uh, there's like a lot of fruitiness. There's like some like, black currants for me as well. Some like, like ripe banana flavors as well. Um, once you leave it in, 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 in the in the in the glass, what I feel as well, like once he opens a little bit uh, um, the flavors, uh, it starts to show a little bit of like um, like a, a cellar, like old like a, like damp cellar, like must, uh, which I really like because it expresses a little bit the the flavor of time. It's uh, it like a little bit old, uh, which I, I really like in these in these in these graduates. Um, I don't know if anyone picks the 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 flavor impact from our still, uh, the, the kind of like the the smoky burnt toast a little bit in, in the aftertaste. Maybe just me, um, or maybe I'm, I'm just bu bu burning a lot of toast there, uh, yeah. back at home. Um, there's a question come in. I, I think we're running out of time. I don't know, Dane. You, you um, rush me on. The question from Jeffrey is, 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 in theory, is this a single grain or a pure grain whiskey? But what's, I mean, there's a, this is a very politicians and long answer, so I'll try and keep it quick. But um, making whiskey in England, there are no rules. So we can actually, we could actually just pour New Make Spirit through uh, over a pencil and tell you it was whiskey. We would never do that. But actually, there currently are absolutely no rules because we left the EU and the Scotch look after themselves, the Scots. So there are actually no rules. In theory, 
I don't, I'd say this is a rye whiskey. It's over to 51% rye. But um, that starts talking, because I, I don't know if, if, I'm, if I'm getting this wrong, Jeffrey, but I, it's not really in Scottish terms that's the best way to define it. It's more American terms of whiskey. Rye whiskey was really made famous by the US of A. Um, but I, I think the answer is, you know, we say Oxford rye proudly because we are above 51%, which is the American rule. Uh, and that rule is, is used in Europe uh, as well. So uh, I think the answer to your question quite straight up is it's, it's a rye whiskey. But also, interestingly, it, it, there are no rules at the moment in England, um, so, which, which is why you know, there's also no um, history of using heritage grain in whiskey production, apart from inadvertently, uh, pre-1900. People weren't actually doing it like that. So again, it, it's kind of hard. To, we're not constrained by rules and we like that, but then it's quite hard to fit into categories that, that whiskey lovers quite understandably uh, anchor themselves to. I hope that answers the question. I think John, Charlie, friend, uh, Francisco, that's absolutely what Oxford seems to do. It's been doing this sort of thing for over a thousand years um, and just bucking the trend and going, we're going to do it this way and we're going to find out how it works. And that's how we innovate in this city. So uh, thanks so much for a thrilling romp through these bottles uh, with the flavours and the smells. And the. I really love, I love this bottle with the stuff in it to see where it all came from. And I'm interested to see, and we'll obviously have a conversation offline later on, but in two years time, if I've got my my new make and my uh, rye, and then the whiskey that comes out of that at the end, it'd be interesting to maybe compare that in a couple of years time. Thanks so much everyone for coming along. Some really great questions. Interesting point about the water, Oxford taps, not too bad. Um, oh. And really interesting um, questions around diversity and what does that mean? Uh, so thanks ever so much for joining in. I hope you enjoyed the flavours and the whiskies. Obviously, you can buy more of it uh, from Toad's website. Um, and we will look forward to seeing you maybe at some more festival events over the next week or so. But uh, Charlie, Chico, John, thanks so much. And obviously, Susan in the background, too, for helping in the back. Um, a really fun event. Thanks so much for coming. And we'll see you again soon. Good night.